further ado, he needs no further introduction. My friends, Yaakov Kirshen. So I made a list of jokes. Look at these jokes. The problem is some of them are anti-Semitic. <laughs> some of them are politically, well, all of them are politically incorrect. The camel joke is on this, which my first wife always said I should never tell. My second wife doesn't mind if I tell the jokes, because she never comes to my speeches. So. <laughs> So first of all, I've lived uh, a little less than half of my life in the States, a little more than half of my life in Israel. Uh, and since we communicate with Jewish humor, I discovered there's a 
difference between Israeli Jewish humor and American Jewish humor. So the kind of jokes I would tell in Israel or the kind of jokes I would tell in America have a different flavor to them. Okay? So I'll show you what that's like. Uh, American Jewish jokes. Uh, my American Jewish jokes are old, of course, I lived in America <coughs> a long time ago. So there's a joke about uh, Richard Nixon, and he's in the White House, and a giant spaceship lands on the White House lawn. And this spaceship is 17 stories tall. And the spaceship is surrounded by tanks and artillery and helicopters are flying around and the army is there and, and soldiers are, are down on one knee with bazookas and they're pointed at this thing. I can't get over the fact that I have two... <laughs> So Nixon's looking out from behind the curtain, and uh, he's got to do something. So he goes down to the spaceship, pushes his way through the crowd, and he stands there looking up at this giant thing. As he's looking up, he hears a sound. I was hoping for that sound we heard before. It was that kind of sound. And he sees a crack on the spaceship, and this crack describes a door. This door is nine stories tall and the door slides open and a weird looking alien comes out. This alien is so tall he has to bend down to get through the nine story tall door. It's very thin. He's all dressed in black. He's got long fingers. And he stands there, and a second alien comes out. Same thing, huge, black clad, weird looking, long fingers. And a third one comes out, licks and looks up at these three towering figures. And he says, where are you from? And the alien says, we are from Alpha Centauri. Nixon says, does everybody in Alpha Centauri dress in black? And he says, only the Hasidim. <laughs> <laughs> so a second American joke <laughs> is about uh, Bush. <coughs> and Bush is running for president. And, uh, of course, if you run for president, you need money. So if you need money, you end up sitting with a room full of Jews, eating Jewish food. So poor Bush is sitting there, and they give him a uh, bowl of matzo ball soup. And he drinks a little soup, and he sees these matzo balls floating there, and he takes a spoon, and he cuts one in half, and he munches, and he eats it. Takes the other half, and eats it. And he says, this is very interesting. I've never had this before. What is this? And they say, those are matzo balls. And he says, do you use any other parts of the matzo? <laughs> now, those are American Jewish jokes. I'll tell you an Israeli Jewish joke about leadership. This joke is about Olmert, Prime Minister Olmert, who successfully united the country. It was the most amazing period of time. Because up until Olmert, whenever you would go to a party, it would disintegrate into right-wing Israelis and left-wing Israelis and arguments and really it was bad feelings. But when Olmert came in, we would get together and everybody would say, what are we going to do about this guy? It's like total <laughs> unity. <laughs> so, so there was an Israeli joke, Israeli Jewish joke 
about a guy who's driving from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv. And he's driving on the highway, and all of a sudden, whoa, everybody has stopped. As far as the eye can see, there's just a line of cars. Nobody's moving. Accident, roadblock, what could this be? He sits there, he sits there, time, nothing's moving. And then he sees some guy is coming from car to car. The guy comes finally to his car. The guy rolls down the window. He says, what's wrong? The fellow says, something really terrible has happened. Hamas has kidnapped Omer, and they are demanding four million dollars. And if we don't raise four million dollars to give to them, they are threatening to take him into the town square in Gaza and burn him alive. And I'm coming from car to car asking for donations. And the driver says, what do most people give? And he says, about a gallon. <laughs> Jewish jokes, uh, what always happens is that if you tell a joke, then they'll tell you there's really a funnier joke, and that joke is older. So I figured that if you got to the oldest Jewish joke, it would be the funniest Jewish joke. So I began to research the oldest Jewish joke, and I found the oldest Jewish joke, and I'm going to share it with you. We have somebody with a microphone that is falling apart. <laughs> that last joke broke the microphone. <laughs> so the oldest Jewish joke I discovered actually is in the Bible. And it's a real joke. And it's in the book of Exodus. I have to set the stage for you. Uh, uh, we have been in Egypt for centuries. And one day they come to us and they say, we're leaving. We're getting out of Egypt. Exodus, we're out of here. So the people said, okay, we'll make some sandwiches. And they said, no time for sandwiches. We're going to bake tasteless crackers on the hot rocks to you. These people, they're pissed. They say, Centuries we're here, and there's no time to make a sandwich. <laughs> this is not the joke. I'm just trying to <laughs> explain to you the environment in which this is happening. So we come out of Egypt, and we march to the edge of the Red Sea. Pharaoh has agreed to let us go. And then he decides, well, he'll kill us instead. This is an old problem we have. But we turn around and we see 600 Egyptian chariots. These war chariots are coming to kill us. These are the killing machines of the day. These are the stealth bombers. These, this is, if you want to kill people, they use these chariots. And here come the chariots. Our backs are to the sea. And we look up and they're coming to kill us. So if Gentiles had written the Bible, it would probably say, and they turned to Moses saying, bring forth yet another miracle. What it says is, they turned to Moses saying, were well, there no graves in Egypt who brought us into the desert to die? <laughs> See, that's the same as the Ulmer joke. <laughs> that joke is based on the idea that we are led by idiots. <laughs> and that they have gotten us into such a terrible situation, couldn't be worse. 
They didn't know that the Red Sea is going to open up. They're going to cross. They're going to get the message from Sinai. They didn't know that they were going to wander in the desert for 40 years because they were led by men who wouldn't ask for directions. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't know they were going into the land of Israel, that they'd had trouble with the Babylonians and with the Philistines. They built a temple, they burned it down, they built another temple. The Macedonian Greeks, the, the Romans, the Jesus, Bar Kokhba, all history lay ahead of them, and they thought, this is it, the jig's up, bad as it can get. And I like to say that I am a real optimist. I really am, because lots of people say, this is as bad as it could get, and I say, it's going to get a lot worse. <laughs> so stick with me. Uh, I think it's time to show you uh, an interesting uh, presentation. I was asked to, uh, but first of all, I'll explain how I was asked to do this, and that is uh, email. Have you guys all written your email down? I hate email. I personally hate email. It's terrible because uh, there are people that I have successfully avoided for the last 20 years. <laughs> and they find me and they send me letters and I'm now talking to people that I thought I had finally... So, uh, so what happens is one day I get an email and it's not an email, no. it, this is an email chain. And the first email is from somebody at the American Jewish Congress, which used to be a really big organization, and they gave their money to Bernie Madoff. <laughs> Another little organization. But somebody from the American Jewish Congress wrote that he had seen a cartoon which was anti-Semitic, anti-Zionist, anti-Christian, anti-Christian evangelicals, and had been drawn by a Jewish cartoons. And what are we going to do about it, this guy says, writing to, I think it was someone in camera. And she wrote back, and it got to somebody, I think, at the ADL, and then somebody else, and it went around until somebody said, Tribal should do something about it, which is when I get the damn email. <laughs> so I answer the email, and then I get a note from some guy who says, I'd like to make you a fellow. Did he think I was a girl? <laughs> Turns out, He's a professor who runs something called the Yale Initiative for the Interdisciplinary Study of Anti-Semitism. The idea is you get people from different disciplines. So you get a historian, and you get a creative writer, and you get a psychologist, and different people can lecture about anti-Semitism. And he wants me to do work on understanding anti-Semitism in political cartoons. And so they make me an artist in residence. And I say, excuse me, I reside in Israel. Israel is not that great a country. If there was another Jewish country, I would move there. <laughs> but I'm not moving to New Haven. <laughs> so he says, you don't understand, artist in residence <coughs> is a technical academic term. It doesn't mean you reside here. I said, okay, if I don't have to reside there, I'll be an artist in residence. <laughs> and he said, we'll send you a Yale book, which will show you all your rights as an artist in residence. <clears throat> I have no rights. <laughs> Everything 
they say like you could get a stipend and then it says fellows, professors, assistant professors, blah, 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 artist in residence, zero. <laughs> so I have a book which proves that I have no rights. <clears throat> but what I had to do was to do research and uh, write a paper and uh, come to Yale, do a presentation, give a little seminar. Chaim Yatz, I've done my, uh, my job. So I went and did it, and I did not for a minute think that I would discover something new. I mean, to discover something new about anti-Semitism that is groundbreaking, mind-blowing, and a real revelation, who would think that I'd be able to do that? Certainly not me. And I did it. So I'm going to show you something shocking, amazing. And I had the chutzpah to think that uh, you're going to suddenly understand something that you haven't understood before. <coughs> so I'm going to come over here and we're going to see if this thing will work. <laughs> Oh, I was going to do my famous barking dog. Okay, so I wrote a paper and I did a presentation. <laughs> Israel is the only country in the world where they have armed guards to shoot people to prevent them from committing suicide. <laughs> this was in 2002 when people were yelling we shouldn't call them suicide bombers, we should call them homicide bombers. And all of this argument was going on, and I said to myself, everybody knows they're not committing suicide. So how do we get it across so that everyone will see it from my point of view? And this is what I did, using humor. And that's the way my cartoons work. Uh, This is, maybe we need to turn down the lights a little. <coughs> or I could draw you a face. A little more. Let there be dark. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa, that's scary. <laughs> okay, so these guys, these, this is a shot from a movie that I love, a movie called Night of the Living Dead, and it's about, uh, this is about uh, a town where everybody is struck by a virus, and the virus turns them into zombies, and the few people who are uh, uninfected by the virus, they hide out, and we watch how they uh, try to defend themselves. I think this is really interesting because when you talk to people about Israel and they make all kinds of bizarre claims and you tell them the truth, you're dealing with zombies. You're dealing with no matter what you say to them, they don't get it. And you don't understand as much as you explain that they don't get it. And the reason they don't get it is because they are infected with a behavioral virus. Okay, uh, so the paper I did at Yale was about this virus. It, the paper was called Mimetics and the Viral Spread of Antisemitism Through Coded Images and Political Cartoons. What I'd like to call it is Secret Codes Hidden War, and right away you want to know what mimetics are. Mimetics is a branch of, I came up from New Jersey on a train today on Amtrak, and some poor English teacher was coming to a convention of English literature teachers, her specialty being 19th century American literature, and this poor woman had the uh, misfortune to sit next to me. 
And she said, oh, what are you doing here? And I said, let me show you. <laughs> and I, I put on the 45 minute version. <laughs> and it came on, didn't have the zombies. And I said, memetics and the viral spread of anti-Semitism through coded images and political cartoons. And I said, do you know what memetics is? And she said, of course. <laughs> okay. What is it? Memetics is a behavioral science way of looking at beliefs. You believe something, okay? You have a chicken sandwich for lunch, and you say, that was delicious. Now, your Uncle Izzy dies, and you figure he's standing in heaven being judged. You don't think that the chicken is standing in heaven being judged. Where did you get the idea that your uncle is alive after he's dead and is being judged? You didn't think that up. That idea was put into your head. That is a, an understanding, a belief that was promulgated by people who taught you when you were a kid, who wrote books, who got you all to sing Adon Olam together. This is, so how do ideas spread like viruses, like brain viruses? That science, that study is called memetics. Okay? So I decided, okay, I'm going to write a paper. First thing to do is to collect cartoons. And the second is put them into categories. Then I write my paper, artist in residence, there we go. So, I get some anti-Semitic cartoons. And you know, you look at these cartoons, and each one you look and you say, yeah, that's anti-Semitic, yeah, that's anti They're all anti-Semitic. Now what? They're all different. What am I going to do? How do I approach this? I get together a little more than 500 cartoons, okay? But they're like pornography. You know it when you see it, but you can't define it. And that's when I discover this cartoon from 1890. It's got a Jewish spider conquering the world. You can't see it, but he's got a Jewish star up here. Jewish star, what we call the Jewish star, the Magen David, the six-pointed star, was never a Jewish symbol, turns out. It was a Kabbalistic symbol. And Jewish organizations traditionally used the menorah or the tablets of the law, all different kinds of symbols. But it was the 19th century that they started to get caught up with the Jewish star, and the Nazis did codification of this so that everyone, including us, recognizes the six-pointed star as meaning Jews, Judaism, the Jewish people, Jewish culture, Jewish ideas, anything Jewish. And so we, here we have a Jewish spider. Then I discover in my 500 cartoons that there's a Nazi Jewish spider. Then I see there's a Soviet Jewish spider. Then I see that there's an Egyptian sp Jewish spider. Then I see from our peace partners a, <laughs> a Jewish spider. And, you know, Judaism does not ban graven images and idols because they're stupid. We ban them because they're powerful. The more you look at this, see, when, when you hear something, it's like in one ear and out the other. But if you, go to a, if you go to a movie, and here's our heroine tied up, and here's this evil guy, and he takes a buzz saw, and he goes and he's going towards her, if you're like me, you cover your eyes. You know she's going to get chopped up, you can hear the screams, it's okay. But if you were to see that image, it would be burnt into your mind and you'd never be able to get rid of it. Because what comes through the eyes gets imprinted on the brain, 
and it's there forever. So the more you look at these, the more you understand that we are looking at the same coded message. And that message is that Jews are spiders. Whoa! Then I discovered this 1900 wood carving of a group of men, bearded men, with yarmulkes on, and they are sipping blood from the body of a child. Okay? And then I say, oh, now I can look at a massive number of cartoons, dozens and dozens and dozens of them, showing Jews are blood drinkers. I'm discovering something interesting at this point. So I find that we have dehumanizing codes which show that Jews are demonic, baby-killing, satanic, blood-drinking vermin, and stereotyping codes that show what Jews do. This is what Jews are, this is what Jews do. Okay? And what is the purpose of these? The purpose of these is to communicate virally the concept that Jews are powerful, they are not human, they're not, you, you can't be sympathetic with a horned, blood-drinking vampire who controls your government and everything else. Uh, and that was successful until the Holocaust. When the Holocaust happened, suddenly the world saw that Jews were pitiful victims, starved to death, buried alive, locked up in concentration camps, used with, with bizarre uh, uh, <coughs> vivisectionist experiments. Unbelievable. Who could believe that the Jews were a threat? So anti-Semites <coughs> said the Holocaust never happened. It wasn't six million people, it was like 12. Uh, that's because anti-Semites are stupid. But a virus knows how to adjust. If a virus is in a situation which is unhealthy for it, if there's some antiviral agent, what the virus does, it evolves a resistant strain. These new codes, I call the moral inversion codes. This is burnt into the brains of every person in this room. If I showed you just this, you wouldn't recognize. If I showed you all this, but this little boy, terrified with his hands up, that's burnt into everybody's brain. Okay. I guarantee you that five years from now, you'll see the little boy photograph and you'll say, oh, that was like the cartoon of the Gaza boy. What the Holocaust resistance strain has done is to say, yes, there are Nazis. Yes, they are fiendish. Yes, they kill little boys. Yes, they set up concentration camps and starve people. And they are the Jews. So here we have Jews or Nazis. Here we have the Temple Mount. We have Bones, which is one of the 34 codes. And we have the Israeli. Doesn't look like an Israeli to me. But uh, one of the codes is Hasidic garb, and one of the codes is the hooked nose. So we have the Jew looks in the mirror and sees that he is himself a Nazi. Now we can look at cartoons from all over the world. Okay? This is particularly disgusting because this cartoon saying, hey, little boy Nazi, hey, little boy Jew, this is done by a contemporary Austrian cartoonist, birthplace of Nazis. Okay? Down here is a pit, the way Jews were herded into pits and the lucky ones were killed before the earth was bulldozed over them. Poor, poor people here with their hands tied. And here is this Nazi uniform guy with a Luger 
killing them, Jack booted. He, he's got a Jewish star on his arm. So what do we have? We have uh, the problem of facing a virus. So you might be depressed. You probably are depressed. But there is a joke. There's a joke about a guy who has a terrible head cold. And he's in Chicago, and it's a dead of winter. And he goes to his doctor. It's snowing outside. And he says, doctor, I'm having a hard time breathing. I've got a terrible head cold. The doctor says, take off your coat. Take off your shirt. I'm going to throw a bucket of ice water over you. And I want you to go out into the snow and walk around the block six times and come back to me. And the guy says, this is going to cure my cold? And he says, no, this is going to give you pneumonia. But pneumonia we know how to cure. <laughs> so the point is, when we had people that we tried to speak to and they didn't understand, we didn't know what to do. Once we know it's a virus, we know what to do. Anybody who's got a computer <coughs> has an antivirus program. Anybody who is alive in this country knows that every September, October, along comes the flu. Cyclical. You had a Seder. The Seder was all about, oh, we were slaves in Egypt, and next year, free men in the land of Israel, and five fingers and one arm, and how many plagues, and this and that. And in the middle of it is a strange sentence. It says, in every generation, they rise up to destroy us. Call Dover Dover. Why did they write this? They wrote this because they had the first clue. First clue is that it's cyclical. When this hatred comes around, it has nothing to do with the reason that they are, in theory, giving you. We now know what that what that clue in the Haggadah is all about. We now know that we're dealing with a virus. Okay? So, as I point out here, you have disease control, antivirus, you have a diagnostic tool. Here's uh, an article from the Jerusalem Post, 2010, the Israeli embassy in Germany com complained about an anti-Semitic cartoon and uh, the dopey Israeli said if it shows a figure with an Israeli flag devouring a Palestinian child, it reminds us of the most scurrilous accusations of ritual murder. Blah, blah, blah. I say dopey Israelis. Oh, dopey me. Uh, this is the poster. You'll excuse me. I don't see any Israeli flag in here. Now, to understand this picture, this is a wooden frame. See? And in the wooden frame is a photograph. It's a photograph of somebody holding up a cartoon. When I looked at this uh, image, I said, gee, I know that image. It's in my collection of 500 cartoons. It's just been translated into English, says Gaza. Right? I don't know what it says here. What I do know is it's distributed by Al Jazeera. Hillary Clinton's idea of a really great news organization. <laughs> you forgive me if I make these asides. It always gets me in trouble. So what do we have here? We have blood drinking, baby eating, blood spilling, and this is controlling governments. America is simply a fork in their hands, and this, of course, is the ubiquitous sign of the Jews. Okay? Now, had it really been a cartoon with an Israeli flag, it would look like that. This says Israelis are blood drinking, baby eating, government controlling. But it doesn't. It does this. And the difference between this and this is really important. And this takes us, I mean, that thing that I did there normally goes on for more than 45 minutes and does not include this. This is Arab Spring. And as we know, Arab Spring is a demand 
for democracy that is spreading through the Arab countries and that President Obama uh, has led the pressure for NATO to support the rebels and to attack Gaddafi. We also know that John McCain went to rebel headquarters and he called for us sending arms to the rebels. So whether the Republicans had won or the Democrats had won, this government would be supporting the rebels. Now, the internet is a very interesting place because stuff gets up there and then it gets edited. So the, the days, in the beginning days of, of this uh, revolution on Yahoo News, as people were filing photographs, I was looking at them and I saw a lot of interesting photographs. Unfortunately, I only downloaded four of them, thinking I'll go back and get the rest. But the rest are no longer there. So I'll show you four photographs that I'm sure the New York Times saw, I'm sure that our government, your government saw, I'm sure that, that the media saw, but for some reason you never saw. This is the anti-Mubarak re uh, uh, rebels having a smoke, reading the newspaper, taking a break. You see what Mubarak's problem is? Okay. Uh, here is, in the crowd, a kid holding up. And what do we have? The star, that's one code. Vermin, that's a second code. Fangs, that's a third code. Blood dripping to show that he's drinking, that's the fourth. I've discovered in all 500 cartoons, there are only 34 codes. This has four of the 34, okay? Some creative genius put on Moshe Dayan eye patch, which I think is a valid, you know, but the rest of it is the codes, okay? So now we get to the rebels. Here's Gaddafi. Jewish star, Jewish star, Jewish star, and swastika, Jewish star, horns, fangs, blood dripping. This is a mosaic of the anti-Semitic codes. Uh, McCain, we know, went to uh, rebel headquarters. Here's an interesting shot of the entrance, I believe, to rebel headquarters. Was this meaningless to him? How come none of you have ever seen these? The so-called Arab Spring is a blossoming of this virus. Okay, so what do we do about it? What we do about it is we get together into an organization, and that organization is going to be Z Street. Can we have the lights on? <coughs> Probably need a joke now, right? See, what this explains, once we understand that we're dealing with a virus, there is a kind of wasp, a wasp that injects little creatures with a paralyzing element. And when the little critter is paralyzed, the wasp lays its eggs into the flesh of the unable to move, paralyzed creature. And the eggs hatch within its body, and the creature is eaten alive from the inside by the larva. <coughs> the effect of these viral codes is to paralyze their targets. And their targets are not us. Their target is Western civilization. 
And so what happens is that a movement like Islamism is wildly anti-female. You don't see a single woman's organization standing up and saying anything. It is wildly homophobic. You don't see a gay or lesbian organization speaking out. It's wildly anti-Christian. You don't see any major church, Episcopalians, <coughs> Baptists, Presbyterians, the major churches don't say boo. Evangelicals are running around complaining. But the major churches are silent. It is totally against academic freedom. You don't see professors yelling about it. So we tend to say, it's so anti-female, why don't the women's organization say something? We're not really asking the question. We're saying, they're stupid. It's a rhetorical question. But we now have the answer. They don't say anything because they are infected. Because the purpose of this virus is to paralyze people into not responding. And right now, we have Western civilization being eaten alive from the inside, and most Americans are paralyzed. The media is paralyzed. Anything that would show you the truth has been suppressed. There is no reason that you have to see those photographs from some dopey cartoonist who's playing around on his computer at home. The media should have brought you this. The newspapers. Okay? So it's good that we have the ZOA, and it's good that we have camera, and it's good that we have Christians United for Israel. But beyond being together as Jews or Christians or whatever, we need a solid, grassroots, Zionist organization made up of people who want to defend Western society. And right now, the attack on Western society is focused at the only piece of Western society that exists in the Middle East. And it's lovely to hear that someone is coming here in the next few weeks or whatever to do a talk about Israel being a bedrock, blah, blah, blah. Rocks get washed away. If you have a big enough tidal wave, rocks get washed away. And Israel is being surrounded by a massive sea of viral hatred that is being assisted by this democratic administration and by the Republican candidate who lost. Whether Democrat or Republican, the American government would be supporting this spread of this virus. So those of us who are relatively free of the virus, and we're none of us free of it, uh, have to band together and have to build a new kind of organization. And we've got to take a, a, a point from the way these people have organized uh, throughout the Middle East. They used Facebook. You guys got to go home. You got to go to Facebook.com. If you don't yet belong, you're going to have to sign up. And then you're going to have to go to Friends of Z Street. And you're going to get there and you're going to click like. And when you click like, you will be a fan of that page. And I will be getting back to Israel in two weeks. And at that point, we will take the hundreds of people who have joined, and we will be a movement with people in the other places I've been to. I've been to 
Chicago and Fresno and Simi Valley and San Antonio and, and uh, Staten Island and Brooklyn and Woodmere and I've been for the last three and a half weeks getting up in the morning, running off, giving a speech, coming back to a hotel, crashing at midnight, getting up at five in the morning, and running to a plane and going to another place. And in each place I'm saying, come do this. I'm also passing around these sheets, and we're going to take these sheets, and we're going to type up your emails, those of you who are able to write in a way that a human being could read them. <laughs> You know how you go to a site and they give you this thing, it says write down the letters? And you say, I can't read these letters. How could I write these letters, right? They're checking to see if you're a human being. I often fail this test. I don't uh, And hopefully when I'm, when I'm back in another couple of weeks, we will have typed up the stuff. And those of you who have been so lazy that you didn't go and uh, sign up, I'm going to send you a letter, and the letter will not be a whole long thing for you to read, it'll simply say click on this link and join the movement. <laughs> and that's the next step for us, and then people say to me, well, what will we do? And what we will do is we will be an organization led by one person who will dictate what to do, what will be, we will be a mass movement, and we will decide what to do. And we'll set up polls, and we'll set up voting, and we will become a mass movement. So that when an American government thinks of Zionism, they won't think of it as being some Jews and evangelical Christians, right? They'll begin to see that there really is an American desire to save American society and to save Judeo-Christian civilization by protecting ourselves and our outpost in the Middle East. I'll tell you a Nazi joke. That's a, uh, that'll be a segue. Hans is walking down the street. Hans is a Nazi. It's Berlin. It's 1936. He's walking down the street and he sees Fritz, his fellow Nazi. And Fritz is coming out of a building. And he knows this is the building of a famous rabbi. So Hans says, Fritz, you're a Nazi. You're coming out of the rabbi's building. What are you doing? And Fritz says, I'm learning. He says, if we are going to destroy these people, we must learn their language. We must learn their culture. We must learn the way they think. We must understand them. And then we can destroy them. And Hans says, that's brilliant. And Fritz says, yes. This is what we call tuchus. <laughs> I'll tell you something interesting about that joke. That is a joke from 1936 Berlin that Jews were telling. Isn't that shocking? And in that situation, we were able to communicate like that. So there's this gay guy, and he's walking down the uh, boardwalk in Venice Beach, California, and he's heard that there is a gay shul. Wow. And he sees there's the gay shul, so he, he goes in, looks around, looks like a gay shul. He sits down in the front row, and he's listening to the service, and he sees next to him is this tall, blonde, good, really good-looking guy, 
and he can't resist, and he puts his arm, his hand, on the guy's thigh. Suddenly, two people jump up, they grab him by the arms, they drag him out, they slap him across the face, and they pitch him into the street. And he looks up and he says, I thought this was a gay shul. And they say, it is. And nobody messes with the Rebbitson. <laughs> the guy comes to shul all the time and he's a member of the congregation and a member in good stead and he's contributed to the building fund and he's always there and can always be relied on in the kiddish but he's never married so the rabbi says I'd like to talk to you yeah? he says look you're a member of the shul you're a member of the congregation and you've never married and really, I think we should get together. We should make a shidduch. It's time you got married. And he says, listen, Rabbi, I have two sisters at home who take care of my every need. And the rabbi says, excuse me. <coughs> sisters can't provide your every need. And he said, I didn't say they were my sisters. <laughs> It's a joke that I wrote. I wrote a joke. Why did I write a joke? I wrote a joke because comedians, comedy writers, used to have arguments and discussions about where the jokes in the street come from. <coughs> People write jokes in the street, and all the jokes taken from comedy routines. So I decided that I would write a joke and I would tell people my joke. And if I told enough people my joke, someday somebody would tell me my joke in the street. <laughs> so I wrote this joke, the capital joke. And uh, I think I wrote it in 74. And uh, I told this joke for maybe two years, maybe three years. And one day, in front of my house, in front of my house in Jerusalem, right off Emmet Raphaim Street, someone in front of my house said to me, Yaakov, I heard a great joke. And he told me my joke. Unfortunately, I'm a Jew, which means I didn't know when to stop. So I continued telling my joke. And then people would start saying, you didn't tell the joke.